Please welcome new media and interactive sculptor, Jen Lewin. Hello. <laughs> 22 years ago, I was camping in a spot um, right next to this uh, scene, I was standing on these rocks, and I had a really amazing and prolific experience. I watched the sunset and the moon rise, and as the stars came out, I was surrounded by tidal pools in all directions that were reflecting light, so I was surrounded by light. Now, I was 1992, uh, and I didn't have an iPhone or a camera to take a picture. Um, and I actually haven't even been able to find any images online. But I did find this, and I hope that this video sort of demonstrates just a small bit of what it was like to stand in a place where I couldn't tell where the sky um, was going to end and the Earth would begin. Now, I was a kid up to this point that loved to make art. I loved to dance. I liked to write poetry. I sang. But I also loved to code. And I learned to code um, in third grade. Uh, this is the first language I learned called Logo. And uh, while I later learned uh, much more advanced languages, I think my love for computer science uh, really happened in this moment because I found something um, coding, and I, I really saw it as a prolific tool to make art. And through my life, I did just that. I made art. Um, but not only did I make some of the artwork, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes, I also made all the tools and the technology behind the artwork. What you're looking at here is a wiring harness for one of my sculptures, the Edison Cloud. Or I would make sensors. This is a custom sensor, a high-speed, long-distance uh, range finder that I used in my laser harps. And I'll show you laser harps in a few minutes. And I would bring all of these things together in interesting ways. This is, um, I think, a good example of this integration. This is a piece um, from also from a long time ago, from the 90s, and it's silk that I've painted and LEDs that I've woven into the silk, and I created a large aluminum form, and there's a PCB that's sort of too big because it's from the 90s, um, and I created a large robotic butterfly that you could dance with, and you could walk up to each of the wings, and they would move towards you or away from you at the same rate that you were moving. Or I would make things like large robotic moths that hung from the ceiling, um, in this case, you're sensing um, pieces on the ground, and they would sense capacitance of um, participants and set the moss in the ceiling into flight. And all of these works from almost about um, 10 to 15 years ago. So while I was building the technology and then experimenting with building art around the technology, I was also using the technology to create interactive experiences, and interactive experiences where people really had to participate to become part of the artwork. And I really found that in my laser harps. I know I've mentioned laser harps several times, but this is one of my early laser harps. And a laser harp is a piece for me where there are light beams. And as you pass your hands through the light beams, they make music. And you can create music collaboratively together. And I think that this image really sort of um, expresses that idea. There's this young girl. She's touching a beam. And there's all these people playing music together. As uh, time went on, I actually um, developed more tools. I got better at what I was doing. I started building permanent work that went all over the country. Um, and I'll show you an example of that. This is a laser harp as well. This is in Minneapolis. It's outside, across from Target Field. And since we keep talking about laser harps, we can listen a little bit to what one sounds like. pieces have hidden Easter eggs, and you can change the sounds, and you can change the lights. Um, and they can really, in this case, for example, activate a public street. But even while I was doing all this work, that moment um, in uh, Australia in Sharks Bay, it, it never left me. I wanted to go back to that, and I wanted to create something that could capture that feeling of playing and being surrounded by light. So I started prototyping with my team. And in um, 2007, we designed this. This is actually my son asleep on this prototype. This is a wireless interactive platform that you could dance on. Um, and it was a meshable platform. It worked over a mesh network. And we put hundreds of these together and created a sculpture I called the pool, which was designed to pull people together, but to also create an environment that let people dance and play and splash in light. And we'll look at um, some videos of this sculpture, the pool. And while certainly this is different than Sharks Bay, it really it, uh, came from that moment and that idea of standing in that outdoor area and gathering with friends um, and being surrounded by light. Um, and as we've um, shown this work, it always has and evokes that spirit, which has, for me, been really wonderful to watch. <laughs> this 
It's one thing to make a piece and show it one time, and then it's another to take it all over the world, which is what I wanted to do with it. I had designed something that I actually specifically designed to be temporary, and I wanted it to go everywhere. And so my team, which has really only three or four people, um, found ourselves in a situation where we were traveling it almost every month. Um, in the last 10 years, it's been to hundreds and hundreds of exhib exhibitions. It's been to um, countries all over the place. Um, it continues to travel. And it's been to really diverse places from Bahrain to Chattanooga to Singapore. And what's been really amazing, because we're such a small team, we get to firsthand take it to all these places in parks and indoors and in the snow and every climate you can possibly imagine. And we've got to see how similar everyone is. Um, in every case, everyone gets this work. They look at it, they laugh, they take pictures of it, they jump in, they play. And certainly along the way, if you can imagine having a piece that's traveled this much, we've learned a lot, learned and found things uh, along the way. I met my husband at um, Google I.O. We were asked to bring the piece, and of course we had to build an Android app to talk to it, so we did, and he actually volunteered to build that app. Um, learned a lot about perseverance, um, even in the darkest of times. The very first time we actually deployed the sculpture after 20 months of building it, we took it to Burning Man, and it was one of the old time, you know, epic, dust storms of Burning Man years past, and it was driven over and completely destroyed. Um, it, it took me several months to kind of come back from that, and then I went back and rebuilt. And since then, it's been built um, fully, almost rebuilt almost six times, and it's been back to Burning Man. This is us installing it at Burning Man. An installation of the pool at Burning Man requires over a mile of trenched cable, which we then hand bury, so it's a pretty extensive uh, installation. Learned a lot about what it means to make a sculpture that you um, jump on, I'm talking about hundreds of computers that hundreds of people jump on, and there's definitely some user testing um, along the way there. Learned a lot about shipping. I would say the hardest thing that I have to deal with is freighting and crating. Um, I have someone on my team who just focuses on this. I would really love to see this industry change, quite frankly. Um, what it means to make waterproof electronics. This is one of our boards after it came back from being flooded. Um, and clearly, we needed to figure out how to change that, and we have. And just constant user testing. I mean, these are tests we just did uh, about two weeks ago. We're crushing LEDs, and we're making sure that data will still pass. Most data LED systems won't survive that. Um, we're freezing them, and then we're heating them up to over 250 degrees and going back and forth and back and forth to make components that I know for sure will be able to survive not just the temporary work I have, but also the permanent work. And all of this is happening in my studio, um, and we're doing this all ourselves. I think it's important to say with this sculpture, though, that this is not a glorified video screen that you dance on. There's no computer. There's no router, master computer, no router. Each one of these platforms is standalone and communicates over a mesh network. And this was deployed first in 2007 when IoT was really still in its infancy and people were trying to conceptualize, like, making a toaster tweet. And we had this massive sculpture, um, mesh ne network sculpture, going all over the world. I keep saying we. Um, this is my team two years ago. Um, and this is right about when I told them that I was really happy with uh, where the pool had gone. And also, this had led to all these new permanent pieces that were, we were doing all over the country and all over the world. But I still wanted to go back to the drawing board once again, because for me, it was missing that element that I showed you in those first two slides, that idea of reflection, that idea of the stars. And I wanted us to keep exploring. So we started playing with dichroic film and got really good at dichroic film. Um, this is us prototyping it. We actually ended up building a piece and, and applying over 10,000 square feet of dichroic film. This is a work we just released um, in, uh, last September called Aqueous, and it's the pool's big sister. It's the next version of the pool. And we'll watch some videos of it of the very first time that we ever actually were able to test it. The piece was too big for me to ever lay out in my studio in whole. And so we took it again to Burning Man and tested it and watched this drone footage on really the first time we ever got to see it. So, you know, if you're ever going to deploy a large mesh network sculpture, why not do it for the first time in the desert? <laughs> so. 
This work has three different platforms that are derived from the golden ratio, and it allows me to install a different configuration everywhere it goes. So every time I install it, there's a completely new pattern. Um, and we'll see what happened actually in the very first night um, that it was installed. This is our first night. So exciting, but honestly, uh, very terrifying. Aqueous has traveled um, around as well. It went to DC. This is it um, just recently in the snow. Uh, it's been to LA. It actually was here in LA and it's coming back to LA in November. And as you can see, every time that it's installed, it's a different pattern here. It's weaving through the trees. Um, it was just installed and opened in Sydney. Um, and this is in the botanical, Royal Botanical Gardens right next to the Opera House. Um, and that opened just a few nights ago. And uh, lucky enough, we actually brought it here. So it's here and it's out on the Catalina lawn. So I invite all of you. <laughs> I invite all of you to play on it. It's come a long way from Australia. It'll um, probably keep to continue changing. I, I can't really help myself. Um, but I invite you to connect with it, to dance on it, to play with it, and to, as we always say, motto in my studio when it comes to my work, to please touch the art. Thank you.